Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I speak for a living at this point. I, I give maybe one or two talks a week. And this is, and I'm not pandering to the audience here, uh, well, a little bit, but um, I'm so excited to be here. I, I used to be a sysadmin. Uh, my first job out of college was a sysadmin. Been using Linux since I was 12. And so, what's that? That's what happens when you don't have any other hobbies in high school. Um, and so I'm, I'm just really excited to speak to an audience that I can actually say, like, you are my people, or I am one of you. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm also, I mean, this, is, this, I hope, will be a little bit of tough love for a community that I think needs, needs to receive it. All right, so as I said before, um, I used to be a sysadmin. Uh, I'm the principal technologist for the ACLU, which means I explain technology to lawyers. I don't run our, our web server. Uh, I'm not responsible for the TLS configuration on our servers. I don't fix the printers. I explain surveillance to lawyers. And in particular, what I do is I act as a translator. So I, I try and figure out what's happening in the technical community. I read all the papers at Usenix and Oakland uh, and CCS, all the security conferences, and then I try to figure out what law enforcement and the intelligence community are doing, how they are spying on people, and then I feed that information to my colleagues, and then we, we sue the government. Um, thank you for suing the government. So for example, if you've, if you've read about a device called a Stingray in the newspaper, anyone know what a Stingray is, Hands. All right, cool. So that's because of me. I spent four years uh, hunting Stingrays. And then my most recent project has been to, uh, to figure out how the FBI and other law enforcement agencies are hacking into people's computers. There's actually been a dedicated team of agents at Quantico since 2002 who do nothing but deliver malware to people's devices. Last year, I revealed that the FBI had impersonated the Associated Press back in 2007 in an effort to trick a teenager into downloading uh, malware onto, onto his computer. And so this is as the surveillance techniques that law enforcement and the intelligence community use become increasingly more high-tech, it's vital that the civil liberties groups who are fighting for your rights also have the in-house uh, capabilities to, to be able to translate and do this stuff. I'll also say that um, one of the first things that I did after starting at the ACLU was to bring on another technologist, a guy named Daniel Khan Gilmore, who is a Debian developer, he is active at the IETF, and he's, we now have IETF uh, RFCs with the ACLU's name on it, uh, which makes me really proud, again, as, as an engineer. All right, so I, sh I should also confess a few things. So some of you may know that back in 2006, I got in trouble with the FBI for making a website that made fake boarding passes. Uh, at the time, the no-fly list was like, big in the news, and I wanted to demonstrate the ease with which, with which someone could circumvent the no-fly list. And to, to, to do this, I figured a high-profile demo would be the best way to do it. Um, so I made this website, and anyone could go there, and if you didn't change the default settings on the web form, uh, it would make a boarding pass for Osama bin Laden. Uh, and this was not received too well uh, by those in power, and the FBI kicked down my front door at two in the morning a couple days later. So this is the confession part of my talk. So when this happened in 2006, I had a bachelor's degree in computer science, I had at least one year of full-time work as a sysadmin under my belt, and then internships and other things. I had a master's degree in computer security from Johns Hopkins, and I was in my first year in a PhD program in computer security, Indiana. And when the FBI came knocking down, or when they kicked down my door, and they took all my stuff, not a single hard drive that I owned was encrypted. Every bit of data that the FBI seized was in plain text. And again, I, I had a master's degree in computer security. I had, like, <clears throat> I, I had written, um, I'd written plenty of stuff in class, plenty of crypto code, but in my mind, the thing that I did at school was different than the way that I practiced my life. I can tell you truthfully that until a couple years ago, I wasn't using a password manager, and I was reusing the same passwords everywhere on the web, and it was only when data breach after data breach after data breach happened, they thought, shit, I gotta do something about this, this is really bad. And so, 
before I, I come and lecture you and say, okay guys, you need to wake up, I just want to be the first to acknowledge that I was a bit slow to this party as well. Uh, I, I haven't always practiced the best personal security, uh, and I, in many ways I got, I got forced to do so by sheer embarrassment from some of my friends. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because I don't want you to feel like I'm judging you from some kind of position, like, oh, shame on you. Uh, I, I have crappy security, too. Okay, so before I get going, uh, I want to ask a few questions from the audience. Some hands in the air. So in the last week, who in the room has opened a PDF file from an, that they accessed from an unencrypted HTTP link, not in a virtual machine on their computer? Okay, most of the room. Uh, who has done the same but for a PDF file that was emailed to them in the last week? Uh, who in the last week has emailed credentials to someone in their organization in plain text? Okay, a couple hands. You know who you are. <laughs> and then I'm really excited, I think this is the next slide, I'm really excited that I can actually use this in this audience. Who's run a command like this? All right, so we know why this is bad, right? So first, it's HTTP, and then piping it to sudo, both, so, sorry? Yeah, I know that there's a few dash options that I removed to make it cleaner, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> telling me, man, tough audience. Okay, all right, so I think what this captures, right, this like the, you know, there are doctors who smoke cigarettes, there are public health workers who, ha who have unprotected sex, and there are, of course, people in this room who know better, who are engaging in unsafe computer behavior. You all know that you shouldn't be opening up random PDF files uh, on your main machine, particularly ones that are emailed to you. you. You know that you shouldn't be downloading random shell scripts from the internet and then piping them to a shell but you do it. Why is it that we are able to separate the security knowledge we have from our daily practice? And I didn't ask like, how many of you have done this in a pro professional setting versus a personal setting, but I think many of us feel like our responsibility to run secure systems ends at six o'clock. When you go home, it's okay to have you know, uh, an easy password on your personal machine. When you go home, it's okay to not upgrade the packages on your computer. You don't, your, your responsibility to practice good information security is only in the workplace where ultimately you're, you're accountable. So hopefully uh, many of you have paid attention, at least some attention to the Snowden stories that have come out. And you know, as I said, uh, you know, in 2006, when the FBI raided my house, my data wasn't encrypted. More embarrassingly, I didn't start encrypting my hard disks until 2009. You would have thought that, like, having, having the government come and take all my data and then look through it would have been, like, the wake-up call I needed, but it wasn't. For three more years, I had plain text, personal, sensitive data on devices in my house. Now, um, when Snowden came on the scene, and, and I should be clear, Ed, Ed is our client. My boss is, is one of Ed's prime lawyers, um, and we've been working with, with Ed for some time. When, when my boss first approached me and said, hey, look, we have, this, we have a client who's dictating the security that he wants. And, and let me be clear, this is not normal. Normally when uh, a client approaches the ACLU for representation, we know more about technology, we know more about privacy and security than they do. But Ed is a special client. Ed knows a lot about computer security. And so he was dictating the security that we had to follow. And as someone who had been advocating for strong security within the organization and maybe not receiving um, the attention that I wanted for that, it was really delightful to have a client saying, no, I will not let you represent me unless you use this kind of operating system on this kind of computer with this kind of graphics card because I don't trust this chipset. It was really sort of cool. Um, but so when, when the Snowden disclosures started coming out, it was a wake-up call for my organization. But I think it was a wake-up call for many in the, in the engineering community. And there, there have been story after story after story. And so it's tough to sort of keep track of everything. And I'm, I, 
I try and read every single story, and even some of them, in my mind, blur together. You know, the first big story, of course, was the news that the uh, FBI and NSA were obtaining records from every telephone company in the country of every telephone call. Now, to be clear, they were not tapping the calls. They were merely getting the metadata of the calls. But that meant that they had a database of every call to an abortion clinic or a suicide hotline or an Alcoholics Anonymous line, calls where the metadata revealed very sensitive information. So that was the first big story that kicked it off. And people said, oh my goodness, this is outrageous. How dare the government do this? But that wasn't really a story that hit the technical community. Then there was a story uh, about GCHQ, which is the British intelligence agency, spying on the unencrypted links between Google's data centers, Yahoo's data centers, and Twitter's data centers. And I don't know how many of you remember uh, when this story came out, I didn't include this in the slide, but when the story came out, the, the Washington Post reporters spoke to some Google engineers, um, and they said that the, the response from the Google engineers after being shown this photo where it says SSL added and removed here um, could not be printed in the Washington Post. Uh, it's not family friendly. Uh, and so the engineers at Google were unhappy to learn that these private links between their data centers were being tapped. But I think for many in the community, the response was actually, what, hang on, Google's not encrypting the links between its data centers? Right, and so the, the surprise there wasn't so much that the government was doing this, but that the companies hadn't been protecting this. And, and to their credit, Google and Twitter and Yahoo and Microsoft, they all fixed this pretty quickly afterwards. They all started encrypting uh, this stuff. And, and to be clear, most of them had been encrypting the links over the public internet. Before that, it was these private links on, on lease lines that they hadn't been encrypting. And so, you know, these stories have come out of bulk interception of HTTP content, bulk interception of address books, exploitation of security flaws, exploitation of weak algorithms or insecure default settings. And I think for many people, not just like the average person, but people in this room, the response has been, well, eh. Because I think, you know, at its core, you know, most people don't think that what they're doing is that exciting, right? And so, okay, you read the story in the news, and maybe, like, if you're really enraged, you, you, you know, you post a comment on Slashdot or, or Hacker News, uh, and then maybe, like, you re-up your EFF membership and get a new T-shirt. But that's, like, that's the extent of, of your response, right? And, and that really what it boils down to, I think, is this idea that, like, I have nothing to hide. My life is actually boring, and so what are they going to learn? They're going to learn that you know, I have photos of my cats and of my kids, and that I play video games on weekends, and that I go hiking, or wh whatever you guys do. You're probably thinking that you're not doing things that are that sensitive. And so why should you, <clears throat> why should you spend the time and energy into upping your security? Right? You feel like you're smart enough to suss out the average phishing email from a real email. You're not dumb enough to download a malicious DivX codec uh, that many users will do. You, will, you cannot be tricked into installing a browser toolbar by one of the many online ad companies. And you feel like, OK, I can take care of myself. So why do I need to worry? You're like, the things that I really wor should wor be worrying about, cybercrime, I can take care of that. And I'm not really a target for a three-letter agency. And I think for the average person, that is indeed a rational response. For the average person, although most people in DC are not uh, average, but for the average person out there, they probably don't have to worry about the NSA or GCHQ or the Israelis, or the Russians, or the Chinese. The average person is just getting along with their lives. And realistically, they don't need to worry about being compromised by a, a nation state adversary. But you're not average people. Even if your lives are boring, you have access to really important credentials. You have access to really interesting systems. Um, and so the purpose of my talk today 
is to hopefully shake you into understanding that you need to protect yourself, even if you think your life is boring. All right, so last year, President Obama, after wave after wave after wave of Snowden's story, he gives this speech, his, his biggest speech on surveillance. He says, and this is, you know, in the wake of spying on Angela Merkel and like all these bad stories that come out. People are abroad are pissed off. Europeans are talking about, you know, blocking Google and Facebook and using the European cloud, which is somehow more secure than the American cloud. Um, and, they, and so the president, like facing this threat of Europe cutting off US tech companies, says the bottom line is that people around the world, regardless of their nationality, should know that the United States is not spying on ordinary people who don't threaten our national security. And when you, when you listen to this statement, this sounds okay, right? The average French person, as long as they're not a member of, of Al-Qaeda or ISIS, they don't have to worry about the NSA turning their massive lens towards them. The average German simply doesn't need to worry about the NSA if you're not up to no good. And if you're up to no good, well, then you deserve everything the NSA sends your way. So who are the kinds of people who threaten national security? Obviously, Vladimir Putin is probably on NSA's um, shit list. Uh, and you would expect that. I don't think I need to explain this one either. Uh, so, so clearly, leaders of states that are opposed to the US are gonna be fair game in NSA's eyes. These people threaten our national security. It turns out Angela Merkel uh, is also in that list. Turns out that the leaders of any country with whom we have significant economic uh, and economic relationship is fair game because we want to know what they're up to. And after after the, the Spiegel story uh, describing NSA spying on Merkel came out, um, the president actually established a policy where he would exempt certain world leaders from friendly countries from NSA surveillance, but not their staff. <laughs> so Angela Merkel's emails and telephone calls won't get spied on, but all her assistants will be still. Uh, so of course, it doesn't really do anything. So who else, who else is fair game in the eyes of the NSA? When you, when you look at what the president said and he says, we are only listening to your email, or reading your emails and listening to your phone calls, if you pose a threat to US national security, who else is in that list other than foreign governments? Well, obviously, you know, hackers working for foreign governments or, or allied with foreign governments, these are, of course, are the, uh, the sort of half dozen Chinese hackers that DOJ indicted last year. Um, we would expect the, the NSA to turn their surveillance apparatus on uh, on foreign hackers who are trying to steal data from US systems, whether US companies, um, you know, in the case of, of the North Korean hack against, the alleged North Korean hack against Sony, or hacks against defense contractors and, and, and other organizations. Uh, last, or two years ago, um, Glenn Greenwald published some slides from his NSA cache showing that the NSA had penetrated the systems of Petrobras, which is Brazil's like big um, state-owned oil company. And it's weird, like, what, well, hang on, how, how does this oil company threaten national security? And so it turns out, if you, if you follow NSA logic, uh, the price of oil is a really important thing politically uh, and in terms of geopolitical national security. The US really wants to know if the price of oil is gonna go up or go down. And so any oil company in the world that, that plays a significant role in the global oil marketplace is, is fair game simply because of the role of oil in our national security. Okay, so all energy companies are, are on the table, fine. Um, and then uh, this spring or this summer, uh, The Intercept, which is Glenn Greenwald's news organization, published a really fascinating story showing that antivirus companies were being targeted uh, by NSA and GCHQ. So wh why would antivirus companies be, be targeted? Well, the first thing is, of course, our government writes malware, and they wanna know if foreign AV companies have signatures in, in the works or whether they are able to detect our malware. Uh, and then they also actually see it as a source of free zero days. So if you spy on AV companies, you can get reports of, of other countries' malware and other countries' 
zero days before they're known to the public. So this is, I'm just going to show a couple of slides. If anyone has a security clearance in the room, you might want to uh, avert your eyes uh, for a couple minutes. Um, so this is from a, uh, an NSA slide deck, using SIGINT to learn about new viruses, so using surveillance to learn about new, new viruses. This is an email that was included from, this is from a guy called Francois Picard, a Canadian researcher. This is an email that he sent to, I think, a dozen AV companies um, with a, an attachment, uh, with an attached piece of malware, a link to a virus total. And so this email somehow ended up in NSA's surveillance dragnet, and then they pulled it out. And it's fascinating because, I mean, this researcher isn't seen to be, you know, he's not a bad guy. He's a legitimate white hat computer security researcher. He finds a piece of malware. I don't know whether one of, his, one of his customers was targeted, but somehow he stumbles across this piece of malware, and he does the responsible thing, which is he emails a bunch of AV companies. Uh, and then because one or more of those antivirus companies are being targeted by NSA, then his, then his communications then get ensnared in that dragnet. So this is the last slide from this deck showing uh, the NSA viewed all of these other companies as targets. I don't know if you guys can see in the back, but there's like companies in Korea and Germany and Austria and Slovakia, like all of the big non-US antivirus companies. All right, but who cares, right? These are foreign companies, and yeah, I guess maybe, maybe if you work for a foreign computer security company, either on the offensive or defensive side, you are a threat to US national security, M maybe. Uh, and then there's, of course, this story. Um, one of, when, when Glenn Greenwald published his book, he included this photo of what's called the interdiction program. Uh, I'm going to just zoom in, like CSI. There we go. Um, so it's upside down, obviously, but you can see that logo, right? So, so under this program, the NSA opens up uh, routers on their way out of the country, pops, the, pops open the, the, the box, uh, reflashes the firmware, and then seals the box up with, with new tape, and then sends it out of the country. And the idea is there are going to be foreign customers who are going to buy US designed and manufactured equipment, uh, and then are going to place it on internal networks, where NSA cannot easily hack into those networks. And so they want to have their surveillance software pre-installed on these boxes. So as you might imagine, when this story was first published, Cisco was not terribly excited uh, to hear the news. Uh, this is the letter that the president of Cisco, uh, the CEO of Cisco wrote to President Obama saying that he was very, very upset. Um, and I think ultimately what Cisco ended up doing was establishing warehouses uh, outside of the United States. So if you're the Saudi government and you want to buy a bunch of routers, now they ship them to you from Brussels uh, instead of from, from California. And so that obviously has, has led to increased costs for Cisco. They're having to keep this stuff on hand and has obviously harmed their reputation uh, globally. All right, uh, and then one more sort of interesting story. Uh, and, and to be clear, this wasn't like the NSA hacking into um, Cisco's uh, data centers or targeting Cisco employees. These were, they were just opening up Cisco products, but it still sort of harmed Cisco. Uh, so one of the most interesting stories from, from, I guess, late 2013 was this sort of back and forth where uh, Greenwald and his colleagues alleged that the NSA had impersonated Facebook, and the NSA said, no, 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 we didn't really do that. Um, so this is one of the, the slides from a program called Quantum. Quantum is, is one of the more interesting things that NSA does. Essentially, they have a bunch of servers out on the internet, and when, when a user they, they want to target tries to access some unencrypted content on the web, NSA's servers respond before the legitimate server responds, and the NSA response gives you a link to malware. And so the idea is they need to be closer to you than the legitimate server of the site you're visiting, and they need to have a faster, lower latency link. So this program is called Quantum, and there's a bunch of versions of Quantum. But the one that's most interesting here is something called Quantum Hand. Um, and that's, uh, this exploits computers who are, uh, 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 this exploits the computers of users who are visiting Facebook. And so this is from 2010, before Facebook went HTTPS by default. So at the time, everyone who was using Facebook was getting it in the clear. 
And so anyone who monkeyed with the traffic on the way to and from Facebook servers uh, could, could deliver malicious JavaScript to users. So when this story came out, that Facebook was being impersonated by, um, by the NSA, Mark Zuckerberg uh, posted something to his Facebook wall, uh, which is what you do when you're the CEO of a company. Um, and he said, in essence, that he was really mad. Um, so Zuckerberg actually called up the president on the phone uh, to explain how mad he was. <laughs> it's something that I, I'm not able to do. Um, or I guess neither could the CEO of Cisco do. Um, but again, I think this sort of demonstrates the extent to which uh, the NSA will go to, to, get what, to, to do what they think their job is. Uh, you know, Facebook is not the company with the best reputation in the world. Facebook needs every bit of karma they can get to retain what little trust in the, uh, of their users they have. Uh, and so for the NSA to go around impersonating Facebook is, is pretty, pretty nuts. Okay, so the examples I've just given are of NSA sort of targeting foreign, foreign people, foreign um, oil companies, foreign computer security researchers, and then using the reputation or risking harm to the reputation of US companies. And to be clear, NSA probably does more than this, but you know, what we have to go on is the stuff that's been published in the, in the Snowden documents. Um, for some reason, the stuff that's been published uh, about GCHQ, the British Intelligence Agency, is much more revealing. I don't know if that's because GCHQ just doesn't care and does anything they want, or if they're, they just talk about it more in their slides. Um, but one of the most interesting things that I've seen, uh, and, and you'll, you'll see me talk about this more in a, in a bit, is, and there isn't like a sexy term to describe this, but essentially it's hacking to enable surveillance. It's hacking people who themselves are not bad people because they have access to systems that the intelligence agencies want. So I'm going to read you something really boring. Um, this spring, uh, the British government became the first government in the world to publish uh, a code of conduct for government hacking. So to be clear, the British are not the only government in the world that hacks. Uh, the US has been doing it, well, the, the FBI has been doing it for 15 years, and you know, God knows how long the NSA has been doing it. But uh, in response to a lawsuit by one of our sister organizations, uh, a, a group in the UK sued the British government for hacking, and they said, it's outrageous that you're hacking without a code of conduct. And then, so, the, so GCHU said, okay, well, here's our code of conduct that we just wrote last week. Um, and so I'm gonna read you this section from the code of conduct, and it, it sounds boring, but I'll explain why it's interesting. So this is the code of conduct, quote, where it is proposed to hack individuals who are not intelligence targets in their own right, hacking those individuals should not be considered as collateral intrusion, but rather as intended intrusion. So this is like a really legally way of saying that, it's, that people who themselves are not bad people are fair game if they have access to systems that the government wants. So normally, you know, when, when, we, when we had the first Snowden story break, right, and we had the news about the fact that the NSA was collecting records of every telephone call in the country, sort of the response from the president and senior U.S. government officials was, was twofold. One, we're not getting content. It's just metadata. It's really not that sensitive. Like, don't worry about it. And then the second thing was, look, we don't want your data. We're looking for the needle in the haystack, and to find the needle, we need the whole haystack. And this is an argument that I think appealed to many people. They're like, oh, okay, yeah, technically, there's some really sensitive, damning information about me in that database, but they're never gonna look at it because I'm not a bad person. It's sort of incidental overcollection because they're not able to target the bad people because they don't know who the bad people are yet. And so that, that kind of untargeted surveillance or the sort of collateral damage of surveillance is very similar to what we see in traditional wars, right? So you, you, know, you drop a bomb on a, the, the place where the bad guys are and there's a school next door and you say, oh, you know, we weren't targeting that school. Those, the people that we killed, you know, they weren't the intended targets, but you know, shit happens in war and we'll, we'll, next time we'll try much better to, to target the bombs. What I wanna be clear about is the thing I'm now gonna be discussing isn't collateral damage. This is not the government accidentally hacking the wrong people. 
The, these are situations where governments are systematically targeting people who are not bad people themselves. So, the first example I'm gonna use is a story about a company called Gemalto. Show of hands, who's heard of Gemalto before? All right, so they're a Belgian, or sorry, a, a Dutch French manufacturer of SIM cards. They're the largest manufacturer of SIM cards in the world. If you have a US passport, and you got it in the last, I don't know, eight or nine years, and you have one of those little RFID antennas, uh, they manufacture the, an the antenna and the, and the chip inside there. And if you're a US government employee and you have a CAT card or a PIV card, they manufacture your card. They are the largest manufacturer of, of smart cards in the world. And so um, it turns out that over the last decade or so, many phone networks around the world have moved from insecure, easily tappable 2G protocols to more secure, slightly better encrypted 3G and 4G protocols. And so now there's an encrypted link between your phone and the cell tower that you're talking to. And to be able to intercept those calls, governments increasingly need the keys that encrypt those calls. So there's three copies of the key. Uh, there's one copy on your SIM card. There's another copy on, the, on a server run by your phone company. And then it turned out there was a third copy of that key held by Gemalto, the company that made the SIM cards. So I think the reason for this is that SIM cards are really, really cheap, really, really cheap, like 50 cents or less. Uh, they're manufactured a million at a time, and when AT&T wants an, a million SIM cards, they place an order, Gemalto manufactures them, they send them over on a shipping container, and then they email a spreadsheet to AT&T with those SIM card encryption keys. I mean, this is real, like they, or they FTP it. Um, and, and so here's the thing, like, Gemalto wants to keep a copy because what if they lose the spreadsheet? You don't wanna have, you know, a million SIM cards that can no longer be used. So they keep a copy of that SIM card database around just in case the customer loses it. And so uh, this spring, The Intercept revealed that uh, the British intelligence agency, GCHQ, had hacked Gemalto uh, in order to spy on and intercept telephone calls in places like Somalia where you know, Al-Shabaab is like a pretty serious terrorist organization. I'm not gonna say that the US doesn't have an interest in listening to telephone calls in Somalia, but it turns out that many Somali networks use 3G and LTE, so that means telephone calls there are encrypted. And so the easiest thing for the US to do, the US and the British to do, is to set up a bunch of antennas around Somalia and passively receive these encrypted calls and then decrypt the calls with these keys, but to decrypt the, key, the calls, you need the keys. And so what they did is they hacked Gemalto. So that's sort of interesting from a security of telecommunications networks perspective, but this is a room of sysadmins, so why am I talking about this? All right, so <clears throat> I'm gonna read you some things from the story. Uh, <clears throat> GCHQ clandestine, clandestine, all right, whatever, secretly <laughs> cyber-stalked Gemalto employees scouring their emails in an effort to find people who may have had access to the company's core networks and encryption key generating systems. They cyber stalked the employees. GCHQ operatives identified key individuals and their positions within Gemalto and then dug into their emails. In one instance, <coughs> GCHQ zeroed in on a Gemalto employee in Thailand who they observed sending PGP encrypted files noting that if GCHQ wanted to expand its Gemalto operations, he would certainly be a, be a good place to start. To be clear, they didn't know what he was sending, but they figured if he was using PGP, he was probably sending something interesting and thus worthy of more attention. The, the, the story added that the cyber stalking was not limited to, to Gemalto, uh, and that GCHQ assigned scores to more than 150 individual email addresses based on how often the users mentioned certain technical terms, and then intensified the mining of those individuals' accounts based on priority. <clears throat> so if you were sending, if you were an employee at Gemalto or Ericsson or one of these other um, carrier manufacturers, carrier device manufacturers, and your emails to your colleagues included terms that suggested that you really knew a lot about you know, the backhauls and telephone networking equipment, suddenly you're on their list. And then you suddenly, if you're sending PGP encrypted emails, well, then you really have something of, of value, so let's target you. 
So as part of these operations, GCHQ operatives acquired the usernames and passwords for Facebook accounts of Jamalta targets. This is, this is not about work activity then, right? If they're looking for your Facebook usernames and passwords, they're also looking at what you're doing at home. And I think, you know, as I said at the beginning of this talk, I think many of us feel like our security obligations begin and end from nine to six, or whatever hours you guys work. Um, but the people who are gonna try to attack you, they don't care about the nine to five or the nine to six. If they can get you at two in the morning on a Sunday when you're logging into your Facebook account, that's fine, they'll hang out on your system and then when you go to work on Monday, then they'll spread from your personal laptop or your, the work laptop you brought home to your corporate system. So that was the Jamalto hack. One of the more interesting ones, I think. Um, last year, the same reporters at The Intercept um, published an in-depth analysis of something called Operation Socialist, which was a report on, on how uh, GCHQ hacked into Belgacom. Belgacom being Belgium's largest phone network, but also a major backhaul provider for m many other operators. Uh, according to The Intercept, the malware found in Belgacom systems was one of the most advanced spy tools ever identified by security researchers who named it uh, Region. So this is from some of the GCHQ slides. I'm gonna zoom in in a second, but so what, one of the things they did is they wanted to identify the people who worked in Knox, network operation centers. They had a specific interest in people who worked on maintenance or security. And then the selectors, which is like the search terms that they use to target their hacking, uh, worked either, um, uh, the, the things that they used to trigger were either people using LinkedIn or people visiting Slashdot. Um, and presumably, I mean, this is like five years old, so presumably there are other sites that they would, they would use now. Um, so th they also had this program where they systematically and automatically detected knocks uh, based on, on usage of certain technologies and, and, and certain characteristics. Um, and then this slide says, once they had the IP ranges of these knocks, they would then, um, select the NOC staff to enable quantum insert. Quantum insert is this man in the middle attack against them. So what I'm showing here, these are GCHU slides talking about how they were systematically targeting the engineers who worked in NOX. And, and I wanna be clear about something, right? So whether it's the Belgacom hack or the Jamalto hack or one of these others that I'm, talk, that I'm gonna talk about afterwards, these are not terrorists. These are not drug dealers, they're not pedophiles. When you think of the kinds of, of bad guys that are, that are described to the public to justify what intelligence agencies do, right? I'm perfectly okay with the government hacking into the computers of foreign leaders, that's, that's fine. Like, foreign leaders are fair game, they have their own intelligence agencies who are there to protect them. Uh, I'm perfectly fine with uh, with governments spying on, on really bad drug dealers and, and pedophiles and terrorists. Like, go for it. But that's the story we've been told about why we need these intelligence agencies. And then what does it turn out they're doing behind the scenes? They're targeting regular people who have husbands and wives and kids and dogs and sometimes cats. Um, these are, these are decent people. There, there's no evidence that the engineers at Jamalto or the people who worked in these knocks are bad people. They're regular, decent people who happen, because of their jobs, to, ha to their systems are interesting enough and they are a means to an end. And as someone who comes from this world, as someone who used to be, like, I, I worked in a SOC uh, in, in the Security Operations Center for a company that managed Belgium's uh, identity database, like their national ID system, which I, I would have been a totally legitimate target uh, when I was one year out of college, right? And, and this bothers me because, you know, when, when you're at that recruiting fair in college and, that, you know, there are these companies saying, oh, come and work for us and do this and, you know, there's a company doing the video games and they say, oh, you can play all these video games for free and there's Google and they say, oh, come here, we have these smoothies and massages and you're like trying to pick which career you go down and the sysadmin stuff like sounds really fun 
Nowhere when I was signing up to be a sysadmin did someone say, oh, and by the way, you're now fair game for the biggest intelligence agencies in the world. But we are, and you are. Um, going on, these, uh, these documents say that, uh, that they named three male Belgacom engineers who were identified as, as targets to attack. And again, these weren't people who they thought were bad. They were just thought they were an in to Belgacom systems. And then GCHU monitored the web browsing habits of the engineers, geared up to ent and then geared up to enter the most sensitive and important phase of the operation. They set up a malicious page that looked like link LinkedIn to trick the engineers. They sent them you know, those annoying LinkedIn emails that we all get. And then when they clicked on those links, they uh, delivered malware to their computers. So what does this mean? Does this mean that clicking on LinkedIn links is, uh, is dangerous behavior? Well, yes. Uh, does this mean you should ban LinkedIn from your corporate networks? Well, probably. Um, but what I think it also means and, and shows is that not only, uh, not only are you fair game, but to get at you, they will use the full arsenal of tools they have. So here we have them using both malware and signals intelligence. They, they collect all these emails that are going in plain text over the, over the internet. They, they're collecting all the web browsing that's going over HTTP. And then they look through that. Well, you know, which pages did these engineers go to? What search terms have they searched for? Where, is the most, where, where on the web are we most likely to be successful in hacking them? And then, quote, by adding the malware on the engineers' computers, the spies had gained control of their machines and were able to exploit the broad access the engineers had into the networks for surveillance purposes, making it clear that these engineers were not the targets. They were just, uh, just a means into Belgacom systems. OK, just a couple more. Uh, last year, <clears throat> Der Spiegel and The Intercept published a story about how uh, several of uh, Germany's largest satellite internet operators, so companies that provide internet service in places in Africa, um, had been hacked. The documents list central employees at the company and stated that they should be identified and tasked. This included the CEO of Stellar, which is the, one of these satellite companies, and nine other employees. All right, and then one of, one of the most interesting stories, how many people in this room have heard of the Athens Affair? This is like one of the, the coolest and scariest stories um, from the last few years. So essentially, 2004, uh, Greece holds the Olympics. Everyone you know, it's just a few years after 9/11, uh, it's after 9/11. So everyone's like really, really worried about terrorism. Um, and so the Greeks invite the Americans in to help them with security. And included in that, they. Uh, they invited the NSA in to, to help them with signals intelligence. Uh, a few months after the Olympics are over, uh, an engineer working for Vodafone Greece, Greece's largest phone company, commits suicide under really mysterious circumstances. Then it turns out that they're like the, the, the Greeks in, are investigating and looking at the equipment that he'd set up, and they find that the wiretapping feature in the equipment that the Greeks hadn't paid for had been turned on, and someone had installed a license key, and then had used the lawful interception features in the telephone switches to tap the phones of the Greek prime minister and members of the Greek cabinet. So like all of the top people in the Greek government were being secretly tapped, and the calls were basically being sent back to the NSA. So this was a huge, huge scandal in Greece. Um, and like bits and pieces of it have been coming out over the last few years. Um, you know, I think it's, it's an interesting story. There's a, this, this, uh, there's a movie called Field of Dreams. I assume most people have seen Field of Dreams. What's the, what's the cheesy line in Field of Dreams? If you build it, they will come, right? And, and so that's actually like the mantra of surveillance, which is if you build a surveillance feature into your network, at some point someone's gonna use it, and that might not be you. Um, and in this case, there was a surveillance feature built into the core uh, telephone switches in Vodafone's network, and then someone else turned it on, uh, in, in this case, NSA. So James Bamford, who is, who's probably the, the best NSA historian, uh, did a, a big story with The Intercept just a few months ago where he went to Greece and interviewed like the brother of the engineer who killed himself. Um, and there are a few anecdotes in that story that I, that I think are really powerful. Quote, uh, in fact, recruiting a foreign telecom employee as an inside person 
for a major operation was standard operating procedure for both the NSA and the CIA. Quote, what the NSA really doesn't like to admit is about 70% of NSA's exploitation is human enabled. What, the, what Bamford is saying here, and he's actually quoting some, an ex-CIA official describing this, is that it's much easier to bribe or blackmail or somehow gain influence over an engineer and get that engineer to you know, install a thumb drive and a piece of equipment or type a few commands at a keyboard than it is to hack that equipment over the network. Uh, when, when I saw this number, 70% of NSA's exploitation is human enabled, I was blown away. Right, so in this case, the, uh, the, the operation ended with the suicide of an engineer or the mysterious suicide of an engineer, which is tragic uh, in, so, in so many ways. But the reason I bring this up is, you know, what, the, what this anecdote tells me is that you don't just have to worry about people hacking into your computers. You have to worry about blackmail. Now maybe, you know, or, or bribery. Maybe if the idea of someone offering you a briefcase full of cash or lots of drugs uh, sounds nice. Um, but, you know, that briefcase full of cash and, and the drugs and the attractive men or women who meet you in the hotel bar, like, they're there for a reason. Uh, and they're going to want something from you. And it's not going to be good. Uh, this, this, the same story adds, covertly recruiting employees in foreign telecom companies has long been one of the NSA's deepest secrets. And you understand why, right? Like once, once a telco suspects that they have a mole on the inside, then they start looking for that person and it becomes uh, increasingly difficult for that person to, to, stay, to stay secret. So I don't want you to, to come away from this presentation feeling like, oh, you know, I saw this keynote from this guy at the ACLU and all he did was complain about the NSA and the British. Like, I'm not here to, to say that one country is better than another. I'm not here to say that the NSA is more aggressive than any other uh, intelligence service or that the British have the weakest laws that allow the most surveillance, although I think that is probably uh, the case for the UK. Um, the reason I'm talking about the UK and the NSA is because we have the Snowden documents. That's it. If, if there had been a Chinese Snowden or a Russian Snowden, I'd be up here talking about how the Russians systematically are hacking US engineers and stalking them. If uh, we had a Chinese Snowden, I'd be up here talking about how the Chinese government bribes and blackmails engineers into installing malicious software on their employers' networks. But I don't have the Chinese Snowden documents. I don't have the Russian Snowden documents. I don't have the Israeli Snowden documents. But to be clear, those documents all exist. And those governments are doing the same thing as ours. We just don't have the smoking gun. Uh, in 2009, for example, Google revealed that they, or in, in early 2010, Google revealed that the previous year uh, they had been hacked by the Chinese. And it wasn't until 2013 that the Washington Post revealed that it had been Google's surveillance team that had been hacked. The, there's a dedicated team of, of employees at Google who do nothing but respond to surveillance requests legitimate lawful surveillance requests from governments around the world. And this team, which was all running Windows, uh, someone on the team uh, got a, uh, a phishing email with, a, I, think, I think it was either a Flash or, uh, or Java uh, exploit. And then from there, they were able to, to access the database of, of intercepts. And so this was the, Ch the Chinese did this because they wanted to know which of their agents the US government was monitoring. And the Chinese couldn't just call up the FBI and say, hey, so you know, who are you spying on? Uh, so they hacked Google and, and found out that way. Um, <clears throat> in that same story, it was revealed that Microsoft's surveillance team had gotten hacked. Then it turns out Microsoft's surveillance team got hacked three years later by the Syrian Electronic Army, uh, who are obviously less sophisticated uh, than the Chinese government. What it shows you is that you know, the people, the surveillance teams at these companies are, are also fair game. Um, back in 2011, RSA was hacked very famously. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys can see this in the back, but this is actually the phishing email that successfully led to the, the hack. Uh, I'm going to read you it. Uh, this, the subject line is 2011 recruitment plan. And then the, subject, the, the text of the email is, I forward this file to you for review, period. Please open and view it, period. <laughs> Seems pretty easy. Um, 
So RSA, like Gemalto, had been keeping backup copies of the, uh, the seeds for their tokens. And once RSA had been hacked, uh, those seeds were then used to break into uh, the networks of several RSA, def RSA customers, um, I think mainly defense contractors in the DC area. Right, so I don't know uh, who, who the target was, uh, whether it was a, a secretary or a sysadmin. It was accounting. It was the accounting department at RSA, right? So the accounting department at RSA was uh, targeted by probably a, a very, very sophisticated agency, even though they didn't need to use particularly sophisticated capabilities here. And so what this means then, uh, and I hope that my, my scary words for you today have sort of uh, really hit this home, is that your targets, whether you like it or not, whether or not you have boring lives, whether or not your computer only contains um, you know, episodes of Babylon 5, Deep Space Nine, and photos of your cats, uh, you are legitimate targets in the eyes of most, if not all, of the well-resourced intelligence agencies in the world. And they won't restrict their hacking of you to your work computer or your work email address. They will look at your personal email address and your personal computer and your personal cell phone and your personal web browsing. If they can find something uh, in your personal web browsing that gives them leverage for blackmail, you're fair game. Uh, I also want to emphasize that the attackers who might target you have budgets in the billions, billions with a B, um, and access to all unencrypted data going over the internet. Right? Resources and the means and the access. These are really, really powerful adversaries. So that means that you guys have to shift your tactics if you, if you don't want to be the conduit through which your employer gets hacked. That means that you cannot be sending data uh, over the clear anymore. You cannot be opening up random PDF files and Excel spreadsheets and Word documents. Uh, and if you are going to open them, they need to be opened in a VM on a computer that doesn't have access to your SSH credentials or your PGP keys. Right? This, this doesn't work anymore. And it didn't work 10 years ago, but you didn't really have the evidence uh, before you. Now you can see that engineers and system administrators and accounting departments and legal teams are all fair game. And it's no longer enough to say, well, I'm not breaking any laws. I have nothing to worry about. Now the question is, is your company doing anything interesting? And could your computer be used as a way into your employer's network? And so to conclude, even if you have nothing to hide, you're still useful. You're still a likely target. And that means you need to up your game. It means you need to do what I did, which is you know, encrypt your data, switch to a password manager, uh, stop opening up any content over unencrypted links. It means, it means being paranoid 24-7 instead of just the eight hours a day that you're at work. Thank you very much. So I think I have like 20 minutes, maybe a little bit more for questions. Uh, there are microphones in the aisles if you can line up uh, and, uh, and ask your questions. Also, if the questions can end in a question mark and, um, and not take five minutes to ask, uh, the organizers said that I should, I should ask for that. Um, uh, so on this side. Yeah, hi, I'm Rick Farrow. <coughs> and I, I really, I liked your talk a lot. Um, I would like you to comment on how um, Edward Snowden ended his, um, his part of the interview that appeared on Frontline about a month ago. Um, he was specifically, what he said that I really loved was that we can either focus on offense or defense and not both. And just to t take this and bring it to the audience just a little bit more, one of my favorite things that the NS his Snowden documents came out was that the NSA had figured out how to hack hard drives. So when you booted your hard drive, it wouldn't actually, it would be booting you into a VM. 
Okay, and you would not be able to detect this because this is done at the hardware level. When I asked hard drive, a hard drive manufacturer if they had fixed this, because this is five years ago, they said, oh sure, we're using signatures. Then I found a paper by German researchers from three years ago saying they could, they could still do this. Anyway, tell me about offense and defense, if you would. Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, I think, well, I learned a new term shortly after the Snowden documents came out. It's, the term is no bus, uh, and it's a brevi an abbreviation of, uh, of a few words. It's nobody but us. Mm. And so in, in NSA land, what they, they have this calculus that they, they engage in where if they find a bug uh, and they think that there's a strong likelihood that someone else might exploit it against the U.S., in particular against the U.S. government, then they will disclose that bug to the affected vendors and get it fixed. But the, the best bug for them is one that only they have and that only they could ever exploit. And so that, like, in, in their mind, like the gold standard for a no-bus vulnerability is the alleged backdoor in the, uh, the random number generator that, that NIST uh, cooked up, um, where you needed to have uh, an encryption key that only NSA had to be able to predict the output of the, of the random number generator. In their eyes, that's, that's perfect because it can be sitting there for 20 years and no one else can exploit it. And still right now, the best that the research community has said is, we think the, this algorithm's cooked, this is how someone might do it, but they cannot prove it because they don't have the underlying, uh, the underlying key. You know, this, this debate over whether you prioritize offense or you prioritize defense has really been, um, been heating up over the last few years in part because NSA is no longer the only hacking outfit in the US government. So mm -hmm. on the intelligence side, you have a dedicated hacking team at the CIA, you have a dedicated hacking team at NSA, which is called Tailored Access Operations, which is a fairly big part of NSA now. And then JSOC, the special forces, the people who fly the drones and do you know, the SEAL Team 6 stuff, they also have their own hacking team. So there's like three main hacking teams within the, the intelligence community, and then Department of Treasury had a hacker working for them in 1995. Okay, well, so I was gonna say, and then law enforcement have their own mm -hmm. uh, hacking, so the FBI has, has people, the DEA, uh, we know has purchased software from the Italian company hacking team. And so, you know, as these hacking techniques trickle down from the elite part of the IC, the intelligence community, to local, to first federal law enforcement and then state law enforcement, you have this, this key question, which is, how are they gonna get their stuff onto your computer? And phishing doesn't always work. It's surprisingly effective, particularly against RSA. Um, but it doesn't always work. And so how do you get onto, tar onto the computers of targets who would hopefully not open a malicious link? Well, then you need you know, a, a drive-by browser exploit, or you need some other capability. And, and, and so this is where we're at now, where you have law enforcement saying, the threat that they face from people using encryption is so great, they need to have ways to access uh, in encrypted data. And then those of us in the computer security community saying, well, hang on a second, we don't trust that you won't lose that, that, that method of access, we don't trust that you won't get, will get hacked, and, we, and you know, we think that we should be prioritizing defense over offense. That's really sort of where Snowden is going. I think there are people in the intelligence community who think they can have it all. They think they can have their cake and eat it too in that they think they can keep US systems secure and hack everyone else, uh, or at least they think they can keep the most sensitive US system secure while leaving the rest open to, to, to foreign nation states. All Thank right, you. over there on the side. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your talk. I wish I could say that I was surprised at what the NSA was doing. Uh, instead, I have to admit that I'm impressed by the degree of sophistication, breadth, and depth of their deviousness. Uh, it's really impressive. I've always maintained that I've had no secrets, and now I am certain that I have no secrets. <laughs> but I believe you misinterpreted the, uh, the code of conduct, and I'm curious what you think about that. I read it as, if you're going to spy on an individual, you're acknowledging that they are directly being spied on and not collateral. It, it is a moral statement that you know what you're doing if you go after an individual. It doesn't make it right, it just means that if you're an intelligence officer, you understand that you are looking at a person, they're not collateral. So to, to expand on, on, on that British Code of Conduct, uh, my, my friends at Privacy International are suing GCHQ. As I said, the Code of Conduct was in response to their lawsuit. 
Um, I've had numerous conversations with you British government officials about this sort of enabling uh, surveillance. You're right that that code of conduct in that paragraph are describing, you know, make sure that you're, that you're treating this kind of hacking as A and not B, but this is the first and only acknowledgement from the British government that they even do this kind of hacking. And so the only reason, that I'm, not, I'm not talking about the ethics of it there, I'm just saying we don't, we don't have anything equivalent in the US where NSA even acknowledges that not bad people can be legitimate targets, whereas the Brits are at least, um, at least a little bit upfront about it. I think, the, I think the NSA is saying we want it all, and we're allowed to have it. Maybe. Uh, well, they're not saying it, they're just doing it. Okay, uh, on, on this side. So uh, it's probably too late for me, and probably too late for at least some other people. And, you know, I'm running an NSA laptop over there. What do you do after, you know, if, if I've sort of seen the light here, what can I do to protect myself and my company? So what can you do? You know, when, when the Snowden stories first came out, particularly like the, the, the first one with the Verizon metadata database, I, and I thought, okay, what's gonna be the impact uh, of these stories? You know, maybe we'll get a, a few changes to some laws, but largely the, po the political ramifications have been minor. There have been really small tweaks uh, to US law, but s for the most part, NSA is still doing what they were doing before the Snowden stories came out. And the more the time has gone on, I've become convinced that the biggest long-term impact from the Snowden stories is not gonna be in Congress or in the courts, but actually in the computer science community. I think there, before Snowden, I think, I think there was a tendency, particularly you know, with the standards that come out of the IETF and W3C and other uh, engineering organizations, you know, you'd have these designs by committee and there'd be a protocol that would come out and everyone wanted to compromise, so there'd be like 30 configuration options. So these protocols were far too complex. The default settings would not be secure because there'd be someone saying, oh, we wanna implement this on an embedded system and we're gonna have a low, low speed processor, so let's have 40 bit encryption as a default or something like that. Um, you know, the, you're, the, the gentleman over here was right. Like a, a, lo a lot of what has come out you know, you look at this and you say, man, that's really impressive. From an engineering and computer science perspective, like, good for you, NSA. Like, like that's pretty cool. Uh, and the fact is, you know, if, I, if you give the smartest engineers in the country $10 billion, uh, they're going to come up with some cool things. But also, yes, they have been innovative. Yes, they have done some interesting things. But they've also harvested a hell of a lot of low-hanging fruit. And I think that the computer science community has done a really bad job over the past 20 or 30 years of allowing all that low-hanging fruit to sit on the tree and rot. And we had protocols that were past their sell-by date. We were introducing new protocols that still were not secure by default. Um, and I think you know, those Snowden stories really proved to be a wake-up call for the community that develops protocols and standards. And I think now we're gonna start seeing you know, TLS 1.3 with only secure, uh, you know, algorithmic op options. We're only going to have secure default settings. Uh, you know, I think the move, the reason why we have David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, and President Obama, and the FBI Director, and all these government officials complaining about end-to-end -end encryption is we're finally delivering encryption in a usable way to users after 30 years of giving people PGP and then being surprised when they can't figure out how to use it. Um, so I think, you know, post Snowden, what we've seen is a radicalization of the engineering community. Um, and we're finally starting to deliver products and applications and protocols that are secure by default. So to answer your question, what can you do? I think the first thing is to start using modern technology. Um, you know, I've been really excited uh, how many people in this room have downloaded and tried to use the program Signal on their, their smartphone? Okay, so Signal is, if you haven't tried it, it's really cool. It's, it's one of the first uh, usable, highly secure uh, apps for encrypted text messaging and encrypted voice calls. It's free. Um, the, the voice component uses ZRTP, a protocol designed by Phil Zimmerman, the guy behind PGP. And then the text component uses uh, a protocol called Axolotl, which was designed by Trevor Perrin and Moxie Marlinspike. Uh, it's, it's had numerous audits, it's open source, it's really, really good, and it's, 
actually subsidized by the State Department um, because we want to allow uh, dissidents in Iran and China to communicate. So uh, I've basically given up on PGP. I've stopped recommending it to new users. I think it's, it's too easy to shoot yourself in the foot. But when I see tools like Signal or I see Apple with FaceTime, although iMessage backs up things by default, uh, uh, unencrypted to Apple servers, um, when I see WhatsApp rolling out, Axolotl as well, I see a future where at least our voice and text communications are going to be encrypted. I don't know how to hide metadata yet, uh, and I don't think anyone else really has figured out how to do that reliably. But, so the first thing is, let's embrace, the, let's embrace the security tools we know work. The next thing is, we need to kill plain text on the internet. Everything needs to be encrypted, and the IETF is moving in this direction. I've spent the last five years begging and pleading and harassing companies to switch to uh, TLS on their web servers and then start TLS on their email servers. And I know start TLS isn't perfect and it, it's easily man in the middle of all, but at least it protects you uh, against passive adversaries. I think we need to use the crypto where we can. And then, you know, there are some really exciting product or projects right now uh, intended to make penetration resistant operating systems. So the two most exciting things are cubes uh, and subgraph. Cubes, uh, for those of you who don't know, you have like these, these VMs for every different, every different program on your computer. And so when you open an attachment, it fires up a new VM, it displays the PDF, and then when you're done, the VM gets destroyed and you're back to, to where you were. And so you can actually have a usable email client there where your PDF isn't being opened in the same VM that's storing your PGP encryption keys. And so right now I'd say, you know, if, you're, if you want to tinker on the weekend, download Cubes and try it out. And then I guess the last thing I, I, I'll say is uh, about this, you know, how many of you saw the Washington Post story last week about the, the lack of concern for security in the Linux kernel community? S some people, right? So we've had, 15 years of, of efforts by the, the GR security and PAX teams to develop uh, technologies that will allow the kernel to protect itself. And there's, there's a, a cultural divide between the security community and the, and the kernel uh, team. I think you know, the kernel people care about performance and not breaking user space. Uh, and the security people are willing to break anything and take any performance hit to keep a system secure. And there, those sides don't see eye to eye my hope is that, that that story, I mean, a front page story in one of the nation's biggest newspapers about the kernel team is like pretty, it's a pretty big deal. Um, my hope is that that will push people in the right direction. We, you know, when I started using Linux when I was 12, I did it because Windows was a joke. Windows was unstable, Windows was insecure, uh, Windows viruses were, you know, a, a constant threat. And I used Linux at the time because it was, more stable, more secure, and ran on older hardware in a great way. And the fact is that after, after Gates sent out that memo and forced all the Microsoft engineers to learn about security, and they created the, you know, the security lifecycle, and they hired a bunch of great people, both internally and, and as penetration testers, Microsoft got serious about security. And I think Linux uh, has lagged behind, and I think the Linux community needs to shake itself uh, and, into realizing that a 5% performance hit is probably worth it uh, if, we ha if, we can be, if we can get back to where we were in terms of people being proud of the security of Linux. And it's, it's not there now, but, but I hope it will be at some point. Uh, on this side. Sure. Well, what I learned from the LavaBit case was that the government can compel you to give up some information, and they can also compel you to not tell anyone that they told you to give up the information. Uh, so as a sysadmin, do I need, like, should we all go back to our offices and put the sign on the wall that says, like, the government has not yet asked me for any information? Is that a useful thing to do? Uh, so the LavaBit case, has everyone in the room heard of the LavaBit case? Most people? Some? Okay. Uh, this was a, a, a Texan small company that was de delivering secure email. Snowden was one of their users. The day after Snowden's LavaBit email address was published by one of the news organizations, they received uh, a court order to uh, enable metadata surveillance of Snowden's account. They said, sorry, everything's encrypted on our servers, so we're not able to target just Snowden's email account. 
So the government came back and said, that's fine, just give us your, your uh, HTTPS encryption key and then we'll do the monitoring for you. Uh, we'll, we'll sift it out of the 400,000 other users' traffic you have. Um, so the, the LavaBit CEO, uh, Ladar Levinson, he didn't want to turn over his encryption key. The government got a court order forcing him to turn over his encryption key. He did two things that were not that smart. Uh, the first is when the FBI knocked on his front door, he ran out the back door. Mm. <laughs> so I'm not a lawyer, this is not legal advice, but I don't recommend doing that. Uh, and then when the court did uh, provide him with that order, compelling him to give the encryption key to the government, he printed it out in four point font uh, yeah. and then faxed it to the government. <laughs> so uh, that's sort of like paying your taxes in pennies. It's not, uh, you want to be sympathetic in the eyes of the court, right? And so, you know, what, what had happened is Ladar had built an email service that was secure against the threats that were in his mind, in his threat model in 2001, 2002, when he designed the system, which was passive adversaries who spy on the network. He never built the service against an adversary that could come and twist his arm and say, do this or else. And it turns out designing a service against an adversary that has pseudo power over you is really hard. Really, really hard. And you know, my hope is that, the, is that that episode will inspire a generation of new research for how to design systems that the sysadmins themselves cannot compromise, of course, to do so. You know, I, I think what we're seeing now, particularly as, as big companies like Apple uh, and WhatsApp start offering end-to-end -end encryption to their users, and law enforcement are f figuring out that they can no longer wiretap phone calls and text messages, we're gonna see this conflict point, right, where law enforcement increasingly wants to hack endpoints to do surveillance they could do in the past um, but cannot do anymore, and they look, at, they look around and they see that Microsoft and Google and Apple all have the ability to push code to your devices. Right, the auto update features in our operating systems, which are good, like we want automatic updates because it means that users run up-to-date secure code. But I think governments are increasingly looking at those auto update services and saying, oh wait, that's a vehicle for getting our surveillance software onto the device of the target. And of course those companies don't want their update services to be used, but the LavaBit case and a couple others that have, have come out recently really raise the question of how far can the government go in compelling a third party to enable surveillance of their customers? And we don't know the answer to that right now. And the unfortunate thing is, when we get the answer, it'll probably come out of a sealed court case where only the government gets to talk to the, to the court. Um, so does that mean that you should post a warrant canary on your door? Well, that warrant canary is only useful if people are walking by your door. Uh, and so, you know, there are a number of companies that have posted warrant canaries. The best ca canary to date is from a company called Cloudflare, uh, who say their canary, inc including saying, you know, we haven't received orders for all of our users' data, says we haven't received any orders for our encryption keys. That is the thing that scares me the most. Um, you know, but if you're going to post a notice somewhere, it's, again, I'm not a lawyer, this is not legal advice, but it's better to put it on the web where everyone can see it than just on your door. Uh, sorry, 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 go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm the average sysadmin in home, wife, one and three quarters kids, a dog, maybe a cat, and I happen to maybe have a transparent logging firewall or something like that, right? Is there anything that like, I can look at, you know, aside from the normal sort of malware, botnet stuff, antivirus that all of them look at, but is there any sort of traffic pattern that I can look at to let me know, hey, somebody's got some sort of spying connection open on me? I mean, it's tough, right? I'm coming here saying, hey guys, you gotta protect yourselves, when in fact, it's really hard to protect yourself from a $10 billion intelligence agency. And the fact is that NSA's malware doesn't make a connection back to Fort Meade. Right, you can't, you can't grep NSA.gov in your log files. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, they actually take over botnets uh, and then use those botnets for their own means. And so, I mean, it looks just like, if you, if you can find it, it looks like, you know, any hacker. Um, 
you know, I, if they really want you, they're going to get you. That's, uh, there's no real way around that. If they really, really, really want you, they're going to get you. If they have to burn, you know, a million dollar O'Day in iOS, they'll do it. They don't care. Um, for the right target, it's, the right, it's, the, it's worth it. But you can make it more expensive for them. You know, there, there's this old joke. It's really cheesy, right? It's like, you know, you're out in, in the woods with, with one of your friends on a hunting trip, and you see a bear, right? You don't have to outrun the bear. You just outrun your friend. And you just need to be more secure than every other system in your organization. Uh, and then it's their problem. Uh, no, I mean, I, you know, I, I think you can make it more difficult for them. You can make yourself a harder target. Uh, it's unlikely that you're going to see something um, in your firewall that easily, that, that, um, that is obvious. I think what you can do is, you know, I, I think there's been this approach in, for the last 20 years, which is, let's just build a really big wall and keep out the barbarians. And then as more and more companies have gotten hacked, there's been this awareness that, okay, it's actually not about keeping the bad guy out, because the bad guy's probably already in our system, so it's about surviving that and minimizing the damage and then speeding up the rate at which we can discover it and kick them out. And I think many big enterprises are, in, are following those, that philosophy now, but very few individuals are. And so from an individual perspective, you should be thinking, okay, if I do get hacked, how do I recover? How do I minimize the harm? You know, can I, can I design my, my own working environment in such a way that one successful compromise of my system doesn't lead to the catastrophic loss of all of my encryption keys or all the credentials I have? Hopefully that helps. Thanks. Uh, let's see how we're doing on time. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're fine. Go ahead. Uh, so Chris, when I'm looking at your slides, I'm getting a sense of uh, deja vu. I used to work at a defense contractor, and we used to do information security awareness for the employees, et cetera. Now, the narrative there was always the advanced persistence threat. It's the other guys that are doing this to us. So I am curious if you've seen any um, similar security awareness type stuff from other DC area contractors where um, it, we're giving advice to people on how to protect themselves. It was, it was the same thing. Hey, you have privileged information. You're, you're a person of interest. Doesn't matter how boring your life is, et cetera. Um, things to be gleaned there because it's all tradecraft. So who in the room got one of the post-OPM, sorry, we got hacked and lost your data to China emails <coughs> or letters? So how many feds in the room? Uh, or one-time feds? Um, <coughs> so when, so Office of Personal Management gets hacked, like biggest, biggest breach of, of federal employee data ever. Uh, and then what do they do? They sign you up for credit monitoring right. from some <laughs> sketchy company. The email that they send to federal employees doesn't come from a gov email address. It asks you to go to an unencrypted web link where you're then asked to enter your social security number. Um, <laughs> so to their credit, the Pentagon was the only part of the government that shut it down and said, we are not going to allow these emails into our network. They're too scary. They look they look bad, and they're training our employees to do bad things. You know, I, I don't have a good answer for your question about, you know, are, are defense contractors and other parts of the government reluctant to give good training for fear of revealing tradecraft when the things that they're doing for legitimate reasons are often so inept? You know, I, I think we have an imbalance throughout the industry, but particularly in the government, where the offensive folks are really, really good and the defensive folks are really, really bad. And I, I think in part that's because the offensive stuff is sexy and it's exciting, uh, and the defensive stuff is boring, and I don't know. I don't know why we have that imbalance, but you know, typically people who work, th there are many people who work in the US government who when they leave can go and get a job in the private sector easily, but often, you're not wanted for your technical skills. You're wanted for your ability to call your old colleagues and sell the product, right? If you are the CIO at the Department of Veterans Affairs, you can easily get a job when you leave, but that's because everyone wants your help in selling products back to the VA. Most parts of the government, although 18F and, and the US Digital Service are like bright spots in the, in the government, but most parts of the government are not seen as, as excelling in IT. But the NSA is different. The NSA actually is amazing at what they do on the offensive side. And 
we need to do a better job about defense. And I think, you know, as was asked in, in this question earlier, we prioritize offense as a country. And as long as we're prioritizing offense, I think the training we give to people for defense is going to be lackluster at best. Over there. Um, have we technically already lost this fight? If the best we can do is slow them down, like should the place we be trying to fight it be somewhere else, like the courts, uh, the voting booth, that kind of thing? Or do you think technology is still the best bet for protection? So if you, if you ask a fish what it's thinking about, it'll say the water. And so I work for a legal organization. My colleagues are the lawyers who sue the NSA. My lobbyists are the ones who are you know, pushing Congress to pass new laws to protect our privacy. But I, I come from a background in technology, right? And so I, I think that technology has the power to change the world in ways that the law and, and the courts cannot. What I like about technology, yeah, technology is awesome. Um, <laughs> what I like about technology is the courts can get it wrong and Congress can be corrupt and I still get encrypted end-to-end -end communications, right? I love the fact that, that, that you know, the FBI director stands up on stage and wags his finger, and the British government is talking about passing horrible no new legislation, but I can still encrypt my device and encrypt my communications. I can protect myself where the courts have not stepped in and where the executive branch has lied and twisted the law to allow surveillance that is, is simply crazy in its scope. So. Uh, you know, I love technology. I think that technology can, can keep us safe, can protect us, uh, and, and protect our privacy. But that means that this community needs to actually deliver good technology. And for far too long, we have delivered technology that was not secure by default, was difficult to use, and used out-of-date crypto. And so while technology can save us, only good technology can save us. And so I, that's why I spend so much of my time pushing tech companies to improve the products and improve the features that are built into their products. I think I have time for, I guess, I can do both, yeah. Um, so given that we are, uh, if, if they want us, they will get us, as you said earlier, and we are inexorably doomed, sort of. Um, how do we keep hope? How do you keep hope? Um, so I think the first thing to understand is that not all adversaries have the same resources. So I, I view surveillance in many ways in economic terms. Right? So surveillance used to be really expensive for the government. If the FBI wanted to track your movements in the 1970s, they'd have to put a team of agents on your tail. Right? The, the FBI uses this thing called a floating box where they have a couple guys in the front, a couple guys in the back, and the box sort of moves around you. Um, and that isn't just four people, like, because you, you look in your rearview mirror, if you see the same car over and over and over again, you know something's up. So they have to swap out cars, people need bathroom breaks, people only work you know, eight or 10 hours a day. And so it took a huge amount of resources to do 24 hour physical surveillance of someone in the 1970s. Fast forward 40 years, and we have cell phones in our pockets that can be pinged whenever the government asks the phone companies to do it, the cost of surveillance has dropped through the floor to the point that now a single police officer from their desk can track hundreds or thousands of people. And so my concern is that surveillance has gotten too cheap. Um, you know, Chris Rock, the comedian, has this sketch that he does where he talks about his views on guns. And, and to be clear, I'm not talking about views, my views on guns here. Uh, it's a very sensitive topic for many people. But Chris talks about his views on guns where he says that he thinks that guns should be legal, but bullets should cost a million dollars each. Right? Where he thinks that, okay, if you're gonna shoot someone, it, that person needs to really be important. They need to be worth that million dollars. And I sort of use surveillance in that way too. Right? So pre-Snowden, when you look at the Snowden documents that have come out, what's clear is that in you know, the 2008 to 2011 time period, the biggest problem for GCHQ and NSA was in uh, consuming and sorting the bulk data they were intercepting. You know, you look, in 2009, not a single major cloud computing, social network, or email provider was using encryption. And so all they had to do was just, you know, sit on the backbone and dip their net in and just take stuff out. 
And then in 2010, Google turned on HTTPS by default. And over the next few years, Twitter and Facebook uh, and Yahoo and Microsoft all followed. And at this point, I mean, just this summer, the White House announced that by the end of next year, every US government website will be encrypted by default, too. HTTPS is becoming the norm. And when you look at the impact of that, you know, there's a reason that Comey, the FBI director, is complaining about encryption. It's because it's finally being used. And when you, when you force the government from, mo from going, if you force them from being from passive to active, you raise the cost of surveillance. If they have to deliver malware to your box instead of spying on the network, they have to do more work, they, they're more likely to get caught, and they can do it to less people. If you force them to go from an active network attacker to a black bag attacker breaking into your hotel room, you raise the cost even more. And so, yes, if they really, really want you, they will get you. But let's make it as expensive as possible so that they have to pick and choose who they really care about. Because right now, surveillance is too damn cheap. All right. Um, I'm afraid this is the last question. Sorry, sir. So you talk about your hope is that the security protocols are going to become better and that we're all going to move to the new glorious future where everyone is using security by default. Um, so at least at my company, we have to cater to a lot of people who aren't on the cutting edge, who don't necessarily have the economic means to be on the cutting edge. And if what you're talking about is security by default at the other end, how do we get those people there with us? Because otherwise, they're going to hold us back. No, that, that's an excellent question, right? I mean, how, how long should your organization have to support Windows XP if the cost of Windows XP means that you cannot support modern encryption? So you know, as an example, uh, Windows XP and the, the versions of Internet Explorer, I think up till 8, don't support something called SNI which is a, a feature that allows multiple HTTPS websites to use the same IP address. Because there are these Windows XP computers out there that demand a single IP address for every encrypted site, it means that organizations that want to turn on encryption right now, in addition to buying a certificate, which is becoming free, basically, they need to get an IP address, which are scarce. Um, you know, I'm not saying that you, you only make your website work with you know, browser is less than a month old. But at some point, we have to cut people off. And, you know, I understand that that means that the most disadvantaged in our societies risk being left behind. Uh, but actually, when you think about who's stuck behind, it's actually large enterprises, right? It's the, you know, everyone has experienced this, right? So there's like some internal HR application designed in 1998 in Visual Basic by an intern, and that's a thing that everyone uses to put in their vacation time. Uh, and HR doesn't want to put the money into upgrading it because it works fine, but that one crappy intranet application is the reason why your entire organization still uses Internet Explorer. Large enterprise organizations are dinosaurs when it comes to upgrading. And, but they are the ones that have the resources to upgrade. They just choose to not, not do so. And, and I do think that, that yeah, we, at some point, you have to, you have to cut people off. Uh, you know, when, the, when we moved from analog TV to digital TV a few years back, they gave out $50 vouchers that you could use to go and buy a digital TV tuner. I'm not opposed to something similar to, you know, uh, allow people to go to the, to, to the Geek Squad and upgrade their computer to Windows 8. Uh, if, that's, if that's how we have to do it, we have to do it. But you know, given, the, given the extent to which people in DC talk about the importance of cybersecurity, you would think as a country we should be focusing on cybersecurity. And if we, if we are going to live in a society where a significant portion of the population are using 10-year-old web browsers and 10-year-old operating systems, we're not taking cybersecurity seriously. And so I think. We have to get everyone using up-to-date software. Otherwise, there's no way to protect ourselves. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of the conference.